It's a hobby of mine. It's uh, something I like to dedicate uh, my free time to and preserving history. So I just, I think it's important, you know, to keep history preserved so we know where we came from. I'm with the 14th Connecticut Company G Volunteer Infantry Reenactment Unit. I have two relatives that were in the 14th Connecticut. They're both in Company D. Uh, one was from Rockville, Connecticut, and the other was from South Windsor. Both they were cousins. Uh, Oliver Dart Jr. was my closest relative. He was from South Windsor. He lived uh, from where I live today. He lived about two miles away. And they both, like I said, they're both in Company D. They joined up in um, August 1862. They were mustered in. They both shipped out of Hartford late August. They went down to Washington and they marched to the Battle of Antietam in their first engagement, uh, bloodiest day in American history at Antietam, and they fought at the Sunken Road with the 14th Connecticut. They both survived uh, Antietam, both of them. Uh, Charles Dart, his cousin, was a color bearer with uh, Company D. And a little story about Charles was uh, when he was, he would be mortally wounded at uh, Fredericksburg. And he was interviewed actually by a newspaper writer from the Hartford Current in the hospital. And he said to that day, as he's dying, he said, I'd still be proud to carry that flag for my country. At Gettysburg, uh, the 14th Connecticut captured, um, I want to say five, it might have been four off the top of my head, uh, uh, battle flags during Pickett's charge. And uh, they actually had uh, three, three men that won the Medal of Honor for going out there and, and, and getting the, the flags. At one point, the, uh, one of the Confederate flag bearers in front of them dropped, was, was shot and went down and the flag was laying there and one of the officers uh, yelled, that, I need someone to go out there and get it. And two guys immediately jumped over, sprang over the wall. One was uh, William Hanks from Bridgeport, nearby here. He jumped over the wall, and the second guy that jumped up with him was another officer. He immediately got shot and fell down. And then the uh, third guy was uh, Elijah Bacon from uh, Berlin. And the, the three of them ended up, uh, I don't know about the, the, the other officer got shot, but the, I, I definitely know that Hanks and Bacon definitely won the Medal of Honor at Gettysburg for capturing the battle flags going out there. But Hanks, Hanks basically ran out there into, into the fray while all the Confederates were laying on the ground. He grabbed the flag and ran back with it and jumped back over the wall and had it. Order arms. Can I have everyone's attention for safety reasons, please? The Historical Society is going to have us fire a volley, and we're going to be firing in this direction. I cannot have anyone in front of us, whether it's on the side of us or on, they have to be behind us. They're marching 20 miles, 25 miles to get to Gettysburg. Uh, they're in a forced march, which meant they're probably marching a lot faster than we're walking. And uh, they're not stopping and the, it's 85, 90 degrees. Men are grabbing their canteens, trying to drink what they can. And of course, back in those days, they didn't know about uh, you know, dehydration. They just thought that you can't make it, you're not a man, you know, get back in line. And then a lot of the officers would come over with their swords and the butt of the swords, and they'd hit the soldier either in the back or in the top of the head to get them going to say, you know, you're a man, let's get going. And they would kill the poor soldier with a blow to the head or wound him. Uh, severely so he couldn't fight. So they just didn't know. It was just was you march, you fight, hopefully you survive, but a lot of them didn't even make it into the battle. Thank you. 
I'll go through the manual of arms with them. Right now, they're at what's called order arms. Just have your rifle down the side here. The next command would be shoulder arms. They reach over with their rifle, pick it up, bring up their hands, seat it in. That's shoulder arms. Shoulder arms. But if you marched around all day like this, the rifle gets a little heavy. Those rifles they have are about 10 pounds. This one's about 8 pounds. So, so there's different ways they would, they're on the march, that they would carry their rifle. So they would give the command, different commands. One is a right shoulder shift. That one there, it goes to the right shoulder. So they would bring the rifle out in front of them, put it on their right shoulder, bring their arm over, seat it, the arm comes back. That's, a, that's support arms, I'm sorry, support arms. So that was support arms, sorry. Right shoulder shift, they grab it, bring it, bring it up to their right shoulder. Hold it like that. Different ways, different arms hold it, different ways they hold it. So we'll do, we'll do uh, right shoulder shift. Right shoulder shift, arms. Shoulder, arms. Put the other hand, you're watching me. Please don't. That one again, when it comes up, you hold it with your right, your right hand, you're holding it with your left hand. Right shoulder shift. Grab it. Grab it with your left hand. Right. Bring it up to your hand. Up. Now watch. Watch this. Bring it up to your hand. And then you slide it straight up. That's right shoulder shift. Shoulder arm is just the opposite. Bring it down. Grab it. Let it fall right back to your hand. One more time. Right shoulder shift. Arm. Shoulder, arms, support, arms, shoulder, arms, order, arms. Unfixed bayonet. The biggest boys in the streets was in, uh, England and that, and they just had the Napoleonic War. So during the Civil War, they actually used Napoleonic uh, tactics, which is shoulder, we stood shoulder. shoulder to shoulder. And what you saw was instead of using like muskets that could only hit a target at 75 feet, now with the riflings, I can hit a target at 400 yards, exactly what I'm aiming at. That's why you saw the massive uh, deaths during the uh, Battle of Shiloh, Manassas, and Gettysburg. They never changed their tactics. Loading by the nine times. Load. Put your rifle out in front of you. Handle reach back and do your cartridge. Handle cartridge. Handle cartridge. Handle cartridge. Bring it out. Bring it to the mouth. Tear cartridge. Bring it up to the rifle. In front. Charge cartridge. Put the powder in. Okay, 
want you to put your father you, you need to your rammer up just a little bit. Draw, rammer. Ram cartridge. Turn, rammer. Prime. Anybody count how many steps that was? There's only eight. One left. Just wait for Robbie Prime. Shoulder arms is the last one. They would do this over and over and over and over again so that they would get used to be able to fire. They didn't have to think in the thick of fire battle with everything. Bullets flying around you, shells flying around you, people dro dropping dead next to you, people losing their heads, whatever. You can just keep loading, keep firing. So it's second nature. This one I think would be just a slightly better than that one, but they're still good distance that they could travel. This is a 58 caliber. This is a this is a 54 caliber, but even like I say at Gettysburg, they were running out of out of ammunition, so they were actually taking that 58 caliber and jamming it in here. It's soft lead, but it worked. And they got and they, they were firing so they were firing these guns so so much at Gettysburg, they were getting hot that they were taking the, their canteens and pouring them down the barrels to cool off the barrels. Like I said, the, those 150 guys captured 330 prisoners and when they came over the Confederates came over the wall after the battle so said that if we'd known that this is all you had back here we would have walked right through you. But based on how much how much bullets were flying at them, they thought there were a lot more guys, all because of this rifle made in Connecticut. Plus when you reload that you don't have to tilt it up, right? You correct. Can load it, correct. They said stay these, down, right? Like a, yeah. the demonstration we did before that they had to load by the nine times they had to you know open their cartridge box, handle the cartridge, tear the cartridge. They poured, they poured the powder in, and they had to pull a bullet and put that in, pull the ram right out, ram that down. So once they got used to doing this, they could get off about three shots a minute. It's, it's, and you really have to move to get three shots yeah. off a minute. Like I said, with this one here, all they had to do was pull that down, put it in, put it in the breech. And so they didn't even have to tear the cartridge. The gun did it for them. Just cut it right off the back of them. They, they prime it and fire it. Simple as that. They, the, the cartridges that they used were linen cartridges that burned when they fired them, as opposed to these ones they had to tear them out, put the bullet in separately. So I, I would I would think that by the time they got off three in a minute, this one this one here, you could probably get off about anywhere from six to nine. Like I said at Gettysburg they were working in pairs of two, where one guy that's all he was doing was loading. You saw how simple that was to load. If you had the bullet in your hand, there you go, put it in, put it up, put the cap on, ready to go. It's about ten seconds. Uh, this uniform is made 100% uh, wool, and as they say, wool is uh, too warm in the summer and too cold in the winter. It's just not right. Right now, today, this isn't bad, but in most times when you figure they were fighting in April, May, June, and they were marching 20 miles a day to get to a battle, they were dying in this. They were sweating to death, and they said they have one story where the soldiers marched to Gettysburg to fight 20, 25 miles, and they were so wet, they were dripping like they had just taken a dip in a pond. That's how wet it was. And then they had to go in and fight the battle. A lot of smoke came out of it. Not like today where the powder is smokeless. Because when you fired the rifles, that's why they ended up going smokeless. When you fired the rifle, all the smoke came out and gave away where you were. So they were, in modern days, they have smokeless powder. Back then, there was just so much fire, fire power on the battlefield and so much smoke. When you're in that long battle line, you couldn't tell where you were supposed to be. So you're supposed to be looking to the left and to the right, as they call it, dressing the line to keep it straight. You could look down the line, and above the smoke, you would see your colors. The, the, the blue one, the state one, is the regimental flag, and the other one is the national flag. They would have be out in front of the troops. So if you're in battle and you see your flags going back, you know it's your time. You're supposed to be moving back. Cause they're yelling orders, and they would they even give the, the officers would give orders, yelling them out. The, uh, earlier, I was yelling as loud as I could, but if, if there's lots of guns going off and cans going off, it's going to be hard to hear it. I was from Stratford, and I went to uh, St. James, and as a first grader, we would have recess on Academy Hill where there's this large Civil War statue, and it's probably about 40 feet in the air, and you would just be in awe of this 
Civil War figure on top of this monument. And around it, you'd have all the battles that they fought. Gettysburg, Antietam, Fort Fisher. And you'd say, what is this all about? I got to find out more about it. It is a passion for me to go and honor these soldiers because if anything, this war to me is a war that defines our country. Defines our country. Defines our country. Have no home in this world.